What is up everyone, Nick here, and in today's video, I'm going to be showing you guys how to make your very own Iron Man Repulsor Glove with a bunch of cool features, like repulsor blasts, sound effects, and even wireless communication to other devices. So in this tutorial, I'm going to be showing you guys how I 3D printed everything on the Prusa Mark IV-S alongside the MMU-3. I'll also be covering all the electronic components we'll be using for this project, along with how to upload the code and how to solder everything, and finally, how to assemble the glove itself. Speaking of which, I'm going to be using the Universal Iron Man Glove by Do3D. And for the rest of the arm, I'm actually going to be using Levy3D's Mark 42 gauntlet files. And if you're interested in making this project for yourself, Levy3D will be including all the modified files that you see here with the handguard in his Mark 42 gauntlet files, which you can find on wireframe3d.com, which is a 3D model vendor site comprised of super talented 3D modelers who offer high quality 3D models for 3D printing. Now, usually when I work on a project like this, not only would I be 3D printing everything, but I would also be spending days and days and days sanding everything down to get it super smooth before I move on to painting. But for this project, we're actually going to be doing something completely different. Now, in recent years, a lot of 3D printing companies have developed their own systems for 3D printing in multiple materials. In the case of Prusa, they have developed their very own multi-material unit called the MMU-3 for short, which is compatible with the Prusa Mark IV as well as the Mark IV-S, which I have here. Now, unlike the tool changer setup seen on the Prusa XL, the Mark IV-S only has one single tool head, which is where the MMU-3 comes in. At the very start of the process, we have these spools of filament, which feed into these filament buffers, which make the filament travel super reliable, which then feeds into the multi-material unit with a built-in filament selector capable of feeding and retracting the selective filament as needed. Now, it's not the most compact multi-material system since it does take quite a bit of table space for all the five spool holders. However, it is extremely reliable and does a phenomenal job printing multi-material prints like we have here. Prusa Slicer also makes the process of prepping your 3D models for multi-material printing super easy to do, allowing you to easily paint your parts in different colors and gives you a good amount of control over the finer details if you so choose. On top of that, I was able to easily send my G-code files from my computer to my Mark IV-S using Prusa Connect, which is super convenient since now there's no need for me to run to my 3D printer, get the USB, go back to my laptop, plug it in, transfer the G-code, and then bring back the USB to my 3D printer. So a huge thank you again to Prusa Research for providing me the Mark IV-S alongside the MMU-3 for this project. So if you guys would like another project involving this 3D printer, or even perhaps a review covering my thoughts on the Mark IV-S alongside the MMU-3, please let me know in the comments down below. So now let's actually dive into the 3D prints we have here. I, I don't know where to start, they just look so good. <laughs> So number one, we have these two pieces for the handguard. Now they have been extensively modified to fit all the electronics and the PCB I designed for this project. So not only do you have this cool little mount in the center for the PCB, but you also have these two circular points here which mount directly onto the glove. And then you have this nice little slot here which is for the hinge. Now the hinge I actually have right here because it's been 3D printed in place. Now when you 3D print the hinge, make sure that it moves perfectly freely. On mine, it was pretty stiff, so I really had to sit there and work it until it started moving freely again. And next up, we have the lipo holder right here. Now, basically, the lipo is just going to slide from the side, and then we're going to glue this on the inside of the handguard about here. And then of course we have the hand itself. Now this was 3D printed in two different colors. So we have the silk red filament and we have the silk gunmetal filament. Now all the silk filaments you see here are by Polymaker, it is all PLA. Now I haven't installed the piano wire just yet, so this piece is separate, but once we actually start assembling everything, we will need to find a piece of wire to slide through here so we can have a proper hinge. However, once we install the hand plate onto the back of the hand here, this hinge is basically going to be useless. It's only going to give us a little bit of wiggle room when we slide the glove on. But anyways, point is, this thing is absolutely stunning. I really like how the gunmetal looks in all of these little recessed edges here. Now this in of itself kind of makes the whole process worth it. But when you look at the other parts, that's where things get spicy. So we have the inner forearm here, which is printed in three different colors. So we have the red, we have the gold, and then we have all the gunmetal in all of these little details. And this thing just looks insane. And last but not least, we have the outside of the arm, which has four different colors. It has the red, it has the gold, 
the gunmetal again, and then this entire detail section is all silver. Now the 3D model was initially intended to be motorized. It's supposed to have flaps on the top here that open up. However, for this video, we're just going to be focusing on the glove itself. So I'm probably just going to be gluing or fusing this together. But if you guys really wanna see me cover motorizing an arm like this in a future video, please let me know in the comments down below and I'll get around to it. So that pretty much covers all the 3D prints we have here today and now, we can finally start talking about the electronics. So for this project, I wanted the glove to be completely self-contained. That means that all the electronics, including the control board and also the battery and the kill switch and whatnot is all built into the glove. So there's no wires going into my gauntlet or into my suit. So to accomplish this, I designed my very own PCB, which stands for printed circuit board. And this PCB basically contains as many of the electronic components needed for this project as possible, which reduces the amount of wire we have to do for this project so we can keep it very nice and clean and organized. So the very first electronic component we're going to look at is the ESP32-S3 by Waveshare. Now this is by far the most important for this project because it is essentially the brain. It controls everything. And this is where our code is going to be uploaded to. And next up we have the ADXL345. This is a three axis accelerometer. This basically detects where it's located in a three dimensional space as well as accelerations. This is what we're going to be using to detect the placement of our hand, whether or not it's in a upright position for the repulsor blast. And it will also detect the flick of the wrist when we do our repulsor blasts. And then we have the DF player mini, which is essentially a mini MP3 player. So we'll be uploading MP3 files onto an SD card, which is going to go into this SD card slot. Then we have this two watt ADM speaker, which is going to be playing all the sounds from our MP3 files on our DF player mini out loud. And one other component we're going to be using is a a 1K surface mount resistor, which is going to solder onto our PCB right under the DF player mini. So make sure you solder that onto the PCB board first because you're not going to have access to it once we solder up the DF player mini. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely microscopic. I just picked it up and immediately lost it on my table. I have no idea where it went. And for this project, we're also going to be using this giant kill switch. Now, the reason why this kill switch is as big as it is, it could have been smaller. It's just to make it much more practical when you're wearing the glove to be able to reach inside and turn it on and off. Now the last component we need to solder up onto this PCB are the JST-XH connectors we're going to be using to connect the other components of this project. One of the components that's going to be plugging into this PCB is the LiPo charger by Adafruit. Now the way this is going to work is we're going to be connecting our LiPo battery directly into the LiPo charger and then we're going to solder up a JST-XH male connector onto the ground pin and the battery pin and that's what's going to plug into our PCB. And on the other side of this LiPo charger is a USB micro connector. And that's how we're going to be able to charge the battery inside the glove without disassembling the glove and taking the battery out. Now, another component we're going to be plugging into the PCB is this tiny little momentary switch. It's just a little button. Now this button is going to have a bunch of different uses in the future, but in this video, it's only going to be used to enable and disable the NeoPixel as well as the sound effects. Now, speaking of NeoPixels, we are going to be using the NeoPixel Jewel, which is basically a tiny PCB with seven different NeoPixels soldered onto it. I don't have one on hand right now. The only one I have is currently in the prototype for my Repulsor Glove, which we are going to disassemble to install in the brand new Repulsor Glove. But just to be clear, NeoPixels is kind of the name brand that is sold by Adafruit. It's basically just a set of RGB lights. You can get the exact same thing under different names from different brands for cheaper. I'll leave different links in the description to AliExpress and Amazon where you can find the exact same ones for different prices. And last but not least, we have the PCB itself, which you can get from this channel sponsor PCBWay. Now, if you don't know it already, PCBWay is the industry leader when it comes to PCB manufacturing and 3D printing services. From custom circuit boards to innovative 3D printed prototypes, PCBWay offers unparalleled quality, fast turnaround times, and competitive pricing. If you'd like to get your very own PCB for this project, I'll be leaving a project link to PCBWay's website in the description. Now, before we get to soldering, let's talk about how we're going to be coding our ESP32-S3. So the very first thing we're going to do is download the zip file from the GitHub page I'll be leaving in the description of this video. Now, make sure you have Arduino IDE installed. If you don't know what Arduino IDE is, it's a development environment software for writing and uploading code. Once you have it installed, we can go back to the folder we just unzipped and 
we can open up this .ino file and it should bring you to this page. Now, if you're completely new to working with ESP related boards, we're going to need to download a whole bunch of different libraries so that this code can actually work. Number one, we need to get the ESP library up and running. So you're going to click on file and then preferences and then copy and paste the library link I'll have in the description right here in the additional boards manager URL tab. With that installed, we should be able to select the ESP32 dev module from our boards. Next up, we need to make sure that all the libraries that are listed at the start of the code are actually installed onto Arduino IDE. So the ones you'll need to install yourself are ESP32 Servo, DF Robot, DF Player Mini, Adafruit, ADXL345, and Fast LED. The other libraries should be pre-installed with Arduino IDE when you first installed it, or they'll be downloaded in conjunction with some of the libraries we'll be installing. Once all the libraries are configured, we can plug in our ESP32 S3 with a USB-C cable to our computer. Now make sure that the cable is capable of transmitting data and is not just a charging cable. And once we've selected the correct USB port that the ESP32 S3 is connected to, we can hit upload. Now while we're at it, we might as well upload all the mp3 files that are in the mp3 folder onto the SD card and insert it into the DF player mini. Now with all that said we can finally start soldering up our PCB with all the electronic components I mentioned earlier. So let's start with the 1k ohm resistor on the PCB that's going to be underneath the DF player mini and then we can solder up the DF player mini itself as well as the ESP32 and the ADXL345. And lastly we can solder up all the JSTXH connectors which should give us something that looks like this. So now that we have our ESP32 coded and everything soldered up to the PCB board, we might as well start taking care of the things we'll be connecting to the JST connectors on the PCB. So again, for your wires, you're going to need some JST XH connectors, not PH connectors. Those are the smaller version. And we're going to be soldering three sets of wires. So number one, we have a JST connector going to the LiPo charging module. Now this is a two pin connector. You wanna make sure that you have the ground wire going to the ground pin on the board and you have the positive wire going to the battery pin on this board. And for the length of the wire, you're going to need about seven centimeters. And this is going to be attaching to the battery connector on the PCB. Make sure that you have positive and ground going to the correct pins. And next up, we're going to be soldering a teeny tiny momentary button onto a set of wires. Again, we're going to be using a two pin JSTXH connector and we're going to be using about 11 centimeters worth of wire. So we're going to be using a three pin JSTXH connector and we're going to be using about 17 or 18 centimeters worth of wire. Currently, I have my NeoPixel inside of this teeny tiny 3D printed mount I designed. Now again, all the hardware and the 3D models are going to be linked in the description. Once again, double check that you have the correct pins going to the right inputs on our NeoPixel. So we're going to have ground, the power input, and the digital input. And the digital input is what's going to be controlling the different colors and intensities for the lights. So now that we have all of our components sorted, we can start assembling everything. So I guess the very first order of business is going to be drilling a teeny tiny hole back here in our glove. This is where we're going to be feeding our wires for the NeoPixel and for the button. With a little bit of sandpaper, we should be able to sand the inside of this hole for the repulsor so that it's a perfect press fit and this fits inside the hole without any glue needed. So the first thing we're going to do is just feed these wires through the hole we just made. That way we can start plugging these into the PCB and attaching everything to the back of the hand. So now I'm just gonna feed in the connector for the button and we should be good to go. So now we're gonna start the process of attaching everything together. So we're going to take our JSTXH connectors and plug them into the board. And once everything is nicely plugged in, we can finally move on to screwing everything down. So now we're going to take the wires and feed them through the gaps, and then we can take our tiny machine screws and screw the board down into the 3D print. And once that's screwed down, we can take our charging module and screw it into the handguard too, and then we can take our piano wire and feed it into the handguard and the back plate, that way it hinges. Then we can take our LiPo and feed it into the LiPo mount before gluing that down in front of the PCB. Now we're gonna do some more gluing. We're going to grab our hinge and glue it to the front handguard, and then we're going to glue it to the rear part of the handguard. So now we have our hinge installed. We can glue the speaker down too. We're going to glue it next to the PCB on the handguard. And we're gonna do some more gluing. We are now going to glue down a giant piece of elastic between the two halves of the handguard. That way it can spring back into position. 
Now before we screw the handguard down to the hand itself, we need to install some threaded inserts and then we can screw it down with some M3 screws. And now we can start gluing all of our little digits for our fingers. I like using a wooden dowel to help me guide the elastic into the fingers. It keeps me from gluing my fingers to the 3D prints. Now, if you followed all those steps, you should end up with something that looks a little bit like this. So I've gone ahead and bolted the handguard onto the glove itself. I've attached all the connectors onto the PCB. I've glued all the finger digits onto elastics and glued it down to the glove itself as well. And I went ahead and fused together the entirety of the arm. So without further ado, I'm just gonna throw this on and see if it works. So I've got myself a little glove here just to hide my skin. I'm just gonna slip this on. Voila, and slip on the glove. If I can get my fingers in all the digits, that is. This is like the least graceful part of putting on an Iron Man suit. There we go, beauty. So it's not on right now. All I need to do is just flip the switch behind the handguard and the battery should boot this entire system up. So when I point the hand towards the camera, we get that sound effect and we get the wind up with the NeoPixel. And if I flick my wrist, we get the blast effect. Come on, there we go. <laughs> There's a certain trick to it. I haven't quite mastered it yet. Ah, there we go, I think I got it. And if I bring my hand back down, we get the wind down sound and the NeoPixel turns off. Now, like I pointed out at the very beginning of the video, there are other features implemented into the glove for future stuff, but there's also one really neat feature. So right now, if I start gesticulating with my hands, it's just gonna turn on. Now, to avoid this, we can hold the button down for about five seconds. Two, three, four, I guess that's five. And if I let go, the light comes on and it completely disables the sound effects. So now if I bring my hand up, bring it down, doesn't matter, it's not gonna do any blast effects or anything, and the light stays on. Now this is useful for a number of reasons. Reason number one for me is when I'm talking with my hands, it's not constantly being triggered. But now I'm gonna give you guys a sneak peek into a future project. I'm gonna bring out some electronics for a helmet that I'm going to be working on, and I'm gonna show you guys some more features with this glove. So here we have a PCB that also has an ESP32 running ESP now. We've got some servos and we have some cosplay LED eyes for the eyes in the helmet. So let me just grab this USB cable and plug it in. So now this system has power. If I press the button very, very quickly in my glove, it's gonna move the servos and it's gonna turn off the eyes. And if I do it again, it's going to move the servos back into position and turn the LED eyes back on. So that means I don't have to worry about a chin button inside my helmet. I can just have my glove wirelessly communicate with my helmet to open it and close it. But rest assured, I will be covering this in the near future and I will be sharing the PCBs along with the project just like I'm going to be doing with the glove today. So if you have any questions about the Repulsor glove or you have any suggestions for future videos, please let me know in the comments down below. Once again, a huge thank you to Prusa for sponsoring this video by sending me the Mark IV S and the MMU you three to build the glove and another thank you goes out to PCB way for sponsoring this video and for sponsoring the channel and as per usual I will be seeing you all in the next one